Sorry. Uh, yeah, start now. Okay. Hi, welcome to this week's graphics programming virtual meetup. We are following the Berlin Code of Conduct. We have a Discord you should join. We have a Twitter you should follow. And this week we are covering shadow mapping, lesson seven in the Tiny Renderer series. As always, the tutorial link is available here and as well as my code for it, which I need to upload. Uh, but we'll be upload there, uploaded there shortly. So shadow mapping. Shadow mapping is a very common thing in rasterization-based graphics because it is the most popular way to get lights to have occlusion. As we can see here in this picture, there is some light off in the top right corner casting down in this very angry thing, and <laughs> for the better word, and casting a shadow. So all the, his shoulder, the underside of his horn, the side of his face, it's all dark. There's nothing there. So <clears throat> this technique just lets us hide things behind other things and not let the light hit it um, because we're not casting rays, we do not have a you know, simple way to check if a light ray can go through and hit a surface or not. But we're doing rasterization. We, we don't have any of that kind of capabilities. So I had a slide here that is not here anymore. Uh, maybe it's further down. Anyways, so it's Done, shadow mapping is done in two passes. First, you get the depth buffer or depth map of the shadow. You figure out how far into the scene a light source can see. The depth value, uh, depth map tells you that. And so that's the first step and we want to do that for every, for every light in the scene that we want to have cast a shadow. So the shader code for it is very prim very basic because all we need to do is transform vertices into the screen space and then rasterize them so that we can see how far into the scene they are. We don't care what the color is. In fact, we could, oh, I, I dropped a parenthesis, oops. Um, we could not draw anything to the frame buffer and that, that'd be fine because we were writing to the depth buffer instead as evidenced. Um, is this not right to the depth buffer? Oh, right. The triangle function does. That's right. I'm, I'm confusing the shader with the triangle function there. But anyways, it, all, all the color is is just the depth value. And for debugging purposes, we do actually record the frame buffer output because that way we can easily visualize what that looks like. So this is the code that writes into the depth buffer triangle or get one when you call triangle here um, and the things to know is we don't set up the camera for the scene the same way you have an image to write into but that's again just for debugging for the look at matrix or the view the view matrix we simply put the direction of the light in now there is a downside here because the light direction is a direction sure but actually, it, it, it has a problem if you have a lot of stuff in your scene, because right now we only have one depth buffer. So if you had a very big scene, that depth buffer would only cover a part of it, which is not useful. So there's ways to get around that. Similarly, if we had a point light, we would have a problem where we would only be looking at the scene from one perspective, not all six perspectives around the camera. That's where you'd render six depth maps and then create a cube map sampler to use that as your depth or your, what, your occlusion values. So this is what that shadow buffer looks like. It looks like a depth map. It's, that's all it is. Ah, this is where that slide was. So we know how far into the scene the light can go. We've rendered all the geometry and we found out okay in this you know in this part of the scene it can only go very close to the camera but in this part it goes all the way to the end 
which means if there was anything in there, it would be visible by the light. So, but the most important thing is the shoulder here would be occluded by it because its depth is not present. In fact, the depth is higher than that. So if the depth value is farther away than what's in that shadow buffer, then you know, hey, this thing's occluded. This comes in useful later. So here's my description of what point lights and how you need six depth maps to get a full um, cube around the camera. And for directional lights, we use a thing called cascading shadow maps, which means we have a small uh, shadow buffer close to the camera, a medium one further away, and a giant one further away, so that big objects like the terrain or the, a giant building, its shadow will be cast but the shadow buffer resolution will match the depth into the scene or the, how far into the scene that object is. Um, the problem with having a giant, giant uh, depth buffer is it's giant and very hard to compute. And also if you have a lot of lights that becomes prohibitively expensive to compute a giant depth buffer. Fortunately, directional lights are pretty much limited to the sun. So you really only need one cascading shadow map series because it's, it's multiple shadow maps, just like cube map, but with a non three dimensional it's layers. Anyways, I'm getting distracted. Okay, so now that we have our shadow map, we can use that to figure out whether an object is in shadow or not when we render it during the normal pass. And this is the second pass of the shadow mapping technique. So we need to figure out how to take our screen space coordinates or, or pixels and go, okay, this pixel is in this coordinates, this, this space. Is it being occluded by this light? And so we need to be able to map this coordinate from our current space into the space of the shadow map, the one that the shadow map was made in. So thus, we need matrix multiplication, specifically changing of basis. So to do that, we take our current base and our current base is this camera M, and we get it all into one matrix. So we multiply the viewport projection of model view, so it's all one thing. And we also get the light model matrix, uh, light transformation matrix. So we take the viewport projection model view of the camera, or uh, not the camera, the light. So that would be over, you know, here in the scene, and. Then we have the tr uh, transformation matrices from the you know, global space to the shadow buffer, as well as one from the global space to the camera. So what we need to do is we need to invert the camera matrices because then we're going instead of going from a global to a camera, we can do camera to global, and that's what this here does then we can concatenate that with the light matrix and go from global to the shadow buffer, which means we can go from local, or not local, screen space to global to the shadow buffer. Thus, this one matrix has all the gubbins in it to transform a screen space coordinate of our current frame and plop it into the screen space of the shadow buffer. And that's what SP means here. And then we do a perspective divide to make sure that, well, the Z values are correct because it stretches space and it's a nonlinear transform. Stupid projection matrix. Anyways, um, so now. the shadow buffer depth value, then we can say it is visible. Whereas if it was greater than, it isn't visible. Because if we, oh, where's a, um, I have, here's a pencil. Um, yeah, just because if our screen space coordinate is 
in front of the shadow buffer coordinate, then it should be less than because depth values are from less than to greater than. And so then it will go, oh, this is visible by the light. And the inverse, the depth value of the shadow buffer will be less than the one in our scene. It's been included by it. So now we know, hey, this is in our scene or not. And we're storing that as a floating point value of either zero or one. So this is a Boolean operation. It will return a bool and then an implicit cast into a float because we're multiplying it by one. If it's zero, it multiplies to zero. And if, it, if it's one, as in true, it multiplies by one. So that way, when we do our color, we have a whole bunch of other code to calculate the diffuse, the specular, and all the stuff we've covered in previous chapters. We multiply it by the shadow so that all of this stuff either is applied if we're in shadow or if we're not in shadow. And if they were not in shadow, it gets applied. And plus a 20, this is just an ambient term to always give it a little bit of light because we have no global illumination approximation. So we have to do something to make completely occluded parts visible. The end result is this nice grainy looking man or demon. So now that we have them, what you can notice is that there is a, a bit of artifacting on several surfaces. So that's the top of the head, the collarbone, sternum, there's these artifacts. It's, it may not be very visible with the compression, but this is, uh, this is a, uh, what's the term? Uh, okay. Um, it's artifacts. It's what? similar art artifact uh, in ray tracing with like uh, uh, acne, acne, shadow yeah, acne. Yeah. This is an aliasing issue for the most part. And it's, it gets, there's a lot of stuff that goes into what causes this, but there's not a lot of good answers. So instead, we just group force it by uh, multiplying it by some values and adding some other values to it. And that mostly gets rid of it. And there is not an example of it gotten rid of. Wait, there is. It's at the very beginning. Oh, here. And this is with that constant coefficient multiplied and added and uh, multiplied again. So this is what it looks like. So that's everything. Thanks.